Hey everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Today we're sitting down with Rodney Lukash. Hello. Awesome. Hey, Rodney. Hi. Yes. Hello, Alan. How are Thank you? Thank you. Good to be here. Yes. It's such a pleasure to have you all the way from Italy. Thank you. It's amazing. He's just been teaching at Berkeley, the PhD students. Yes, yes. I've been helping, helping them out. Yeah, yep. they've got a great bunch out there. Yeah. Uh, great department. Really, really good department. Yes. And uh, they're lucky to have you. Uh, no, I was lucky <laughs> to. Uh, the, the, the professor was, was kind enough to invite me. Uh, and uh, so I gave a couple of talks and uh, spoke about my work, uh, helped the students with um, issues of methodology and, uh, and medieval literature and Latin literature. Yeah. yeah. Latin literature, medieval literature, a professor of philology yeah. at Enna Core University. Yes. yes. And so you live in Spoleta. Spoleto. Spoleto. Italy. Spoleto. Spoleto, yeah. Italy. Yeah. 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 Spoleto is just north of Rome. It's about an hour, an hour and a half on the train from Rome. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Enacore is a, a hilltop town in the middle of Sicily, right in the center of Sicily. Wow. Yeah. And so I commute between the, between the two. Do you take boat? <laughs> I take the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Sicily is an island, you're right. <laughs> but no, I fly into Catania and, uh, cool. and the rest is easy. Cool. It's all easy. It's all good. Yeah. It's all very, very good. Yeah. Sicily is yeah. beautiful as well. Yeah. No, Sicily is, has got some magnificent places. You will have heard of Taormina, mm. Siracusa, Oof. Palermo, Cefalù. Wow. Uh, Agrigento. Just the way you say it makes me want to be there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, um, I myself am only getting to know it. Uh, I didn't really know it. I used to go down to Pantelleria, an island just south of Sicily for years and years and years. and never really made it to mainland Sicily until I got the position there uh, about three years ago. And uh, it's been a real eye-opener. Uh, one, because of the natural beauty of the place. There yes. are some magnificent places there. Yes, yes. Um, the beaches, obviously. Oh. Great swimming. Yes. Great food. Great sweets i'm not a sweet tooth at all yeah, yeah. but when you when they offer you crema al pistacchio ah, okay. is that pistacchio? We, which is pistachio sure. nuts nuts right uh, okay we, uh, uh, in a cannolo which is a typical oh, you know what a cannolo yeah, is yeah, yeah. Uh, okay when they when they put the creme di pistacchio in uh, it's amazing huh? yeah, yeah 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 and uh, the uh, entrepreneurial um, what can I say? Um, scene, scene, the scene. Well, seen um, the vision, I think, also uh, of uh, the people who founded my university. It's a new university. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, it's one of the only universities in Italy that is expanding rather than contracting. Interesting. Uh, they're hiring. Cool. Uh, their student population is growing. Cool. Yeah. And so uh, this is a university that has an entrepreneurial focus. Yes, okay. definitely. Good. Definitely. That's Which is very also important. why I'm here. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a type of ambassador, if you like. Good, um, good. Yeah. And so maybe some people from Berkeley will say, oh, look, and the core. Well, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 hopefully. <laughs> I actually yeah. hope, I actually, um, recently we've discovered a, uh, a collection of uh, rare um, books, old books, um, early printed books. Uh, in a Franciscan settlement just outside Enna, uh, which, uh, no, I'm not, I'm, my wildest dreams, I'd love it to turn into something like uh, uh, Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose, yeah, and find the, the long lost... discovering books. Yes. Today. Yes. That's so amazing yes. to learn. Yeah. Yes. Not only discovering books, this is an entire collection of books uh, that I've had the luck to, to discover. And sometimes uh, there are books that just have some subjective history, which can still be some value. Yes, but sometimes yeah. it's, uh, it's something that validates something else that's been written in history, and that's really important also, as well. Yeah. Also, um, here uh, there are, I mean, the, the collection has thousands of books. Um, there are manuscripts in Cunabula uh, and early printed books. Uh, I'm, of course, interested in, in the first th these first three categories. Um, but to find a collection like this, the Vatican Library is interested, the secret archives of awesome. the Vatican awesome. are interested. 
Um, and uh, as are uh, the, as is the Department of Italian Studies at Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to invite a few of the doctoral students down to give me a hand to catalogue some of these books. Uh, now, of course, my hope is that there is one book, some books, uh, uh, that do not exist in other libraries. That yeah. is, uh, um, books that will be literally uh, new discoveries, uh, long lost books, etc. Um, or um, rare editions of, of books that we know about. Well, uh, well, so this Hilltop University, and of course, sounds beautiful. Yeah. I really want to go. Um, it, it is, actually. You've yeah. been now there three, three years. years teaching philology. Yep. T teach us about what philology is and how ah. you've been teaching it to the, oh, the kids. Great yeah. question. Thank you. Um, philology is uh, the study of uh, um, the word, really, study of uh, um, how thought is transmitted. Uh, in Italy, it has to do with, uh, in my particular field, with the transmission of that thought, uh, generally through manuscript form, and so I study manuscripts, um, uh, or in early printed book form. Uh, so and the communication of the word, or communication in general, the disseminations right. over time of thought, but yeah. then you it's akin, have... It's akin to literature. It's, yeah, yeah, it's right there with literature, exactly. Right. And then, but then there's a specific study, because then philology could also refer to something like articles or videos or music and things like that. Today, yes. Today. Yes, but so in yes. The, and so you're studying it, uh, teaching about it in manuscript form and in literature form. That's right. Okay. That's right. I deal exclusively with literary texts. Okay. And so, you know, Dante, Petrarch, or more recently, um, early 16th century authors. Uh, my latest book is on uh, Baldassare Castiglioni, Domizio Falcone. Now, um, you said Baldass that so fast. So I'm sorry. You, uh, recent, <laughs> uh, also an author, author of the two Renaissance friends. Yes. And the two Renaissance friends are Baldass Baldassare Castiglione. Yes. And Domizio Falcone. Yes. And so we'll t let's. Let's. Where does that? Maybe we should talk about that after the, some of the Dante and yeah, as you the, wish. Uh, let's let's do that. Let's go okay. in that order. Okay. So yeah. So you're professing. You're teaching. You're teaching other right. students. And so the yes. students are learning about the literature. Yes. And how words have been communicated. Right. And so what are kind of the main important takeaways from that? Um, well. Um in uh, Core is a new university, and therefore I have to st I have to teach various things. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in uh, literature, Italian literature fundamentally, um, and linguistics. Yeah. So I'm teaching a course in the history of the Italian language. Cool. Uh, and which is cool, actually. Yeah. Um, I start from uh, classical Latin, I go right through the Middle Ages, I look at the transformation of Latin, uh, the way in which it becomes Italian, it becomes this Romance language, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I look at the various authors, uh, the various key mo mo moments in history, uh, right until today, actually. Yes. And so from, let's say, Cicero, Julius Caesar, uh, Livy, Virgil, for example, right through to the newspaper you picked up this morning in Rome. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's so yeah. cool. So it's it's a long it's a long mm -hmm. um, journey, but it's it's sexy. It's sexy. <laughs> it is. It's so sexy. Linguistics yeah. and understanding language over time is yes. very sexy. Yes. I love it. Yes. There's this whole thing about George Zipf. Um, right. And he's a Harvard linguist, uh -huh. and Ziff's Law, and right. how fascinating it is that the, the Pareto principle or Pareto distributions apply to language. Oh, right. Um, right. How 80% right. of everything we say is only 20% of words, of all words. So the, of, and, which, right. to. These fillers. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, along the way. Mm. Mm. So uh, I mean, yeah. that applies to Italian as well, which is, you know, it applies to every language, which is sure. so interesting. And then sure. how does the language actually morph over time when things like the Renaissance happen and there's more uh, science of space and science of um, what's microscopic. And then how does it r evolve when there's a new uh, period of enlightenment of some a new sort? And it, that's all so interesting across languages across the world. And so mm. you've had the pleasure of learning about it in the lens of it, Italian. It's, it's become my passion. Yeah. It, it really has. You know when you find your, your little niche 
Uh, well, I found that years ago now, and uh, life is exciting. Uh, and that's not false rhetoric, that it really is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you uh, do find uh, something new, or uh, as in this, this Domizio Falcone is a new entry. No one had heard about Domizio Falcone cool. until I discovered him three years ago. Wow. In the, in the Vatican Library. Oh, interesting. Uh, Nobody was really talking about him or teaching about him at all. No. Wow. No. No. And so because nobody had went through the Vatican Library in enough depth to, um, or, or with that meticulous sense to try and find something new. Um, uh, the Vatican Library contains thousands and thousands of manuscripts, not to mention uh, printed books. Uh, and, uh, and so even with all the staff and uh, the funding that it has, um, it's put a lot of, it's put literally hundreds of manuscripts online in a digitalized form, yep. uh, which uh, is really expensive to do, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Um, and yet, and Carefully, yet, safely, all that, to yes, not hurt Yes, yes, about, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, philologically um, perfect, yeah. um, but, um, but still there is, a, there, the collection there is so huge. Yep. And that's the Vatican Library. Yeah. And yet there are other, there are archives around Italy, um, I presume the rest of Europe, perhaps even here in the States where, um, you know, small out of the way country archives, um, family archives um, that have been lying there under dust for 200 years, 300 years, in our case, five, six, seven, eight hundred years. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're not allergic to dust, <laughs> it, it's a wonderful job. Yeah. 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 You learn so much by being able to go back and look through that. So, okay, so what is some of these, uh, th th wh what, is, what does the course look like for the kids that you've put together? There's one for linguistics and there's one for philology. Mm. Um, so, right, is that uh, how many different courses and then what do those courses look like for the, for the kids? Well, um, um, it depends on their, 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 their studies, basically. There was a study course in, uh, in arts. Uh, which only started this year at uh, mm -hmm. La, the Core, mm -hmm. uh, and that is geared at a certain level. Uh, there is another uh, course which is similar, always in linguistics, always about the history of language, but it's geared uh, uh, for those students who will become tomorrow's primary school teachers. Oh, uh, and so okay. there are there there are there are different aims involved, obviously, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and because they have to learn pedagogy, how to yes, how to oh teach. yes, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, and we have uh, uh, a a whole uh, army of uh, of colleagues who teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Yeah, it's a completely yeah. different field. Yes, yes. Uh, and so uh, the pitches is, is qualitatively and quantitatively different mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. for those students. Um, for the students of uh, what we call lettere, of art, mm -hmm. um, no, it's, it's complex indeed, it's rather involved. Uh, and it does uh, look at uh, language in its transformation right from uh, pre-classical texts uh, through to, uh, to, to, to today. Uh, it, it is complex. And then what are some of the maybe the highlights that the students learn in the, the course with the arts? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what is something that you know the students afterward tell you is like whoa or wow um, that they've learned about? There are, if, if I may, this is a wonderful question again. Yeah, take um, it And a bit embarrassing it. because I mean I'm, I'm teaching them this stuff and so I'm sort of guiding them. Yeah. Um, there are several wow moments. Yeah. Um, w one particularly is um, St. Francis of Assisi, yeah. uh, where in a city called San Francisco, mm -hmm. and on, in honor of St. Francis of Assisi. That's, mm -hmm. that's important. We can come back to that, can, yes. that in a second. Yes. Another one is Dante himself. Mm -hmm. and now, Dante, and now Dante, it might come as a surprise, so that, but Dante wrote in both Latin and the vernacular and early Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's through a Latin text uh, uh, that we have the emergence of the very first linguist in the uh, Western tradition, that is Dante himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, he... How, how is it defined that he's the first linguist though? He's like. the first person to... So he's a poet for a start. Mm -hmm. He's the first poet, the first intellectual, to, uh, to pay attention to the issue of language and how language changes. Mm. Uh, and he's the first one to actually okay. um, categorize languages. 
in the Western tradition. That's an important uh, step back to take. Yes. Uh, you can say you know, philo philo philosophically as well, not only linguistically, yes, you know, scientifically. Uh, and that's kind of where philology was birthed, kind of, when you take that extra step back exactly. and you look down on the language. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, well, any science, really, yeah. any discipline. It kind of works that way, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, there is uh, a metaphor uh, he comes up with, uh, and the metaphor is of this black panther. And so the, the Dante's panther, as it were, and of course the joke is the pink panther, Dante's pink panther, but uh, mm -hmm. it's actually rather serious. Um, the black panther uh, uh, leaves a trail of, uh, leaves his sweet fragrance behind. And uh, uh, Dante in uh, the uh, metaphor, in this hunting metaphor, um, goes off hunting for this black panther around, around the, the towns of central and northern Italy and can't find it, can never track it down. It can smell its sweet mm. fragrance mm. everywhere but can't quite pin it down. And of course the Black Panther uh, is a symbol of uh, uh, this illustrious uh, vernacular. That is, the Italian as it should be, it should have been, uh, it might possibly have been uh, in a court system uh, that was worthy of the name. Uh, and uh, uh, he goes to Bologna, can't, he can smell it, can't really find it. He goes down to Rome, no, it's horrible, it's all, it's, it's, uh, uh, it smells really, really bad in Rome. Uh, even in Florence and in Lucca, uh, Pistoia, in these towns of, of Tuscany, uh, does uh, Dante find it difficult to pin down this panther. Even the, as we might call them, dialects, but the vernaculars of the time, don't really uh, come up to scratch, really. They're not really on, 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 on a par with this idea of the illustrious vernacular. And so we and have that's an idea. That's what descent is. It's the illustrious vernacular. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, the illustrious vernacular, this vulgari illustre, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is what Dante himself would try to forge to create uh, in uh, his uh, work called the comedy, uh, the which we call the Divine Comedy, mm -hmm. uh, as Boccaccio called it, mm -hmm. um, a generation later after Dante. Um, so we have St. Francis de Assisi, we have Dante. Yes. Um, well, then we have uh, the whole issue of language as it, as it comes out in the early 16th century. We go back mm. to mm. the era of my book, my latest book, uh, about Castiglione. So we have uh, uh, three schools of thought, as it were. Uh, we have, uh, you might have heard of Niccolò Machiavelli, the mm. prince. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Machiavelli and Castiglione are in one group. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have a chap uh, called uh, Equicola uh, in another group, practically on his own. And we have uh, Pietro Bembo. Uh, if you're not an Italianist, uh, Bembo will be unknown to most people. Yeah. Uh, incredibly important for us. Mm. Um, who actually wins, he actually wins this, this contest, as it were, this, this whole uh, debate on language. Uh, Ooh, mm. okay, we'll yes. have to get, we definitely need to bookmark that and see, okay. Okay, okay. see okay. how he actually won that. And right. Is okay. that written in your book that's part mm. of uh, No, that, no, 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 no. no okay. No. Uh, uh, no, that's another topic on its, on its own. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, let's start with St. Francis de Assisi. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, teach us about that. That's what year is that? Okay. Why is it um, St. Francis dies in 1226. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, on the night between the 3rd and the 4th of October, 1226. Uh, and uh, he dies in, uh, uh, or just outside actually, a small church that he had rebuilt. Uh, uh, called La Porziuncola. Porziuncola means small portion, so the tiny mm. church. And uh, you have a replica of it here in San Francisco, actually. Mm. Mm. North Beach, is it called? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it was built five, six years ago, mm. eight years ago, I don't know how many years ago. Okay. Anyway, recently. Um, he uh, writes, uh, he writes uh, a poem, which is uh, effectively the very first poem uh, in Italian literature. And so Italian literature begins as a first, mm. okay, with St. Francis of Assisi. And it's called the Canticle, it's got, it's got various names, um, one of which is the Canticle of the Creatures. And uh, uh, what it is, fundamentally, is... Um, Can Cantar sing, right? Or yes, okay. yes. Um, 
and it was actually put to music. It has been put to music. Um, he may have sung it himself, uh, uh, but it's poetry. The Song of the Creatures. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, let's. Uh, and uh, uh, it is basically an exaltation, uh, a bearing of thanks uh, to, to the Lord for having created um, creation. Oh, his, cool. Okay, and so cool. his, yeah, praise be you, yeah. my Lord, uh, for having created uh, um, the stars, yes. the moon, uh, the sun, but also things such as water, such as fire, um, death. Yeah. I thank you for having created Sister Death. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, this is in oh, that's early. Oh, beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so it was. It was like a. It was. It was a token of gratitude for life, for existence. Yes. Um, that's yes. beautiful. Okay. Cool. When he himself is soon to die, uh, he is at the convent of that he had rebuilt himself. Uh, called um, St. Damien's, just outside Assisi, uh, and uh, uh, where he had housed uh, the, the woman who espoused the, prem the, the, the feminine principle within the Franciscan movement, that is St. Clair. Mm -hmm. uh, now, St. Clair uh, is another huge chapter, nothing to do with Italian language directly, because she only wrote in Latin, a woman writing in Latin, uh, on a par with uh, um, many other uh, men of the church who are writing in Latin, by the way. Um, and therein lies a, an issue of, what can I say, the, the omission, um, uh, of knowledge in the history of ideas. We have uh, a woman who has been effectively uh, squashed. Um, her voice is now, only now beginning to be heard. Mm -hmm. Only now have people started mm -hmm. studying her again. Um, but where she is housed, uh, he writes this canticle uh, of praise, of thanks, uh, and uh, therefore ushers in uh, Italian literature. Uh, cool. After the great season of Provençal literature, uh, we have uh, the birth of this great European literature uh, in um, a vernacular which is not Tuscan, uh, it is Umbrian. Umbrian is a region next to Tuscany, just north of Rome. Uh, and uh, uh, it is a, an, an ode, it is a canticle of thanks. Um, that's, so, that's so interesting. I, do, do we know of anyone ever in the past writing a canticle of thanks before St. Francis? Um, the Bible's full of, uh, yeah. canticle of th th canticles of thanks. Correct. Um, one of the main sources for the canticle of the creatures is, of course, the Song of Songs. Okay. okay. Um, uh, it's also the, um, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek for they, etc. Blessed are the poor, blessed, uh -huh. etc. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. in Matthew. And so Jesus on the Mount actually teaching people to be thankful and using this uh, anaphorical uh, structure uh, in, in his poetic sermon, uh, which becomes, of course, the basis for, for Francis. Uh, it's important also from a programmatic point of view and therefore political, because Francis, I'm not going to get through this tea actually, uh, <laughs> uh, because you can see the, the, the passion here. Um, uh, Francis could easily have been termed a heretic. Um, Heresy uh, had uh, a definition in the Middle Ages. One of the uh, facets, one of the hallmarks of heresy what was um, to go about preaching in uh, the vernacular, translating the Bible into a vernacular. That is, making it available for people who could not read Latin uh -huh. uh, to correct, read. Correct. Um, doing so out there on the street of life with women the very fact that women might have been in your fold uh, was enough to have you and your whole movement, uh, in his case the penitential movement, uh, labelled uh, as heretical. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he keenly knew that. Uh, there's also a, um, a division, uh, a manichaean, we call it a manichaean division, uh, that is um, where you have 
a tale of two cities, Paris and London, as in Dickens, or you have uh, the black and the white, or um, the n yeah, day and night, the sun and the moon. Uh, one, is de one is necessarily positive. Uh, the male principle is positive. In the Middle Ages, the female principle is uh, necessarily negative. Mm? Now, uh, if you espouse, if you take on uh, this uh, dualistic uh, understanding of the cosmos, uh, it means that there's a whole section of creation that you are denying. Right? Um, when Francis, uh, uh, who was accused time and time again uh, of being quasi uh, heretical, um, he writes the Canticle of the Creatures. Because in the Canticle of the Creatures, um, everything comes together. Yeah. Everything creature is not in the sense of uh, the sense that we give it today in like modern times. Like a mouse or something. A mouse or it's, Bambi. It's uh, everything. Everything that has been created by God. And yes. So everything yes. is Which is existence. has been yeah. co-created, and therefore everything effectively is our brother or sister. Sister. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah. And for which Francis thanks yeah. the father. That's amazing. Okay. No. So that's St. Francis. Right. That's 1220-ish. Yes. Uh, that's really great. To, that's a good stepping stone for so many to understand um, the thanks for existence. Okay. Mm. Um, next up, Dante is uh, right around like a little after. That's right. A little after him. He's and born in 12, 1265. And then his main thing is the Divine Comedy. Right. And Dante was in exi got exiled. Yes. Well, why did he get exiled? <laughs> he was in the wrong political party. Okay, so it's kind of like what happens today um, when you speak out against a dictator in a country that... Uh, Ooh, still okay. Well, here we do not have one dictator. There is a leader uh, of the opposing faction. Um, his name is Corso Donati the Donati family, an important Florentine family. Um, Dante's own wife belonged to the Donati family, okay. by the way. Wow. And they're called Black Guelphs. Wow, he spoke out against his wife's family. Um, well, he was actually exiled uh, uh, through no direct fault of his own. He was actually away at the time. He was on a diplomatic mission um, at Rome, at the Holy See, either going to or coming back from, uh, we don't know. Um, and uh, he, w he found out that he had been exiled. And what does being exiled mean in the Middle Ages? Well, when you have the concept of uh, the city-state, there is an analogy we could actually draw with, uh, with ancient Greece, actually, of the, of the polis. Um, so everything re revolves around the city-state and its immediate territory. Uh, you know that um, the gates of any medieval city are opened uh, at six in the morning, they close at six at night. If you're in, great. If you're not, you never will be that night. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. oh. There are exceptions. Yeah. Uh, to be exiled... That's so interesting. I just, I, I just can't. I just imagined what that's that's like. In, um, it's in really difficult. Yeah, it's the really 6 difficult. The gates open, so you're trying to be up as early as possible to be able to leave, go do whatever you need, right. get it done, engage, interact with right. people, right. and then once the sun is setting, you need to get your butt back into town um, straight away. Straight away. Straight away. Um, and then the gates close, and then there is people observing and watching to make sure from the top to make sure that there is no uh, bandits or people that are trying to harm the people inside. Absolutely. Or, or armies drawing or armies. exactly whole whole uh, numbers of bandits. That, that itself is just so fascinating that that yeah. used to exist and that I just sometimes I get you know sometimes I almost you know I basically tear up. <laughs> I do like thinking about history yeah. in that sense because it almost part of me almost goes back to my soul potentially being alive at those times. Or what do you mean by that? Um, having lived through it through other people, so through well, your reading, you mean? Well, kind of, but also in a very spiritual way. I don't know how to explain it. Come Ron, on, Ron, get to the point, Alan. Well, Ron, why don't you? Why don't Ron? Why don't you explain it? Well, you're making reference to um, reincarnation of sorts, in which. Uh, and, it's, right. and so part, so, so Ron gives you part of it. Part of it is reincarnation, but the other part of it is 
the global consciousness, the collective consciousness. As in tapping, Jung. Yeah, well tapping, well, tapping into what those humans were experiencing 800 years ago. Mm. Tap, just being able to tap into that experience and being alive through every one of their eyeballs. Through their but that, excuse me, that, that's some feat you're just describing now, to be able to tap into those lives that were lived out and uh, to look at the world through those eyeballs. Yeah. Um, I'm now 54, I've been studying these same phenomena for 35 years uh, and uh, I can't say that I can do that. I have peeps every so often. Yeah, me too. Uh, I am not. I'm not living through it, right? right? I'm just. Right. I'm trying to get little. I'm trying to maximize the amount of peeps, and I'm trying to. <laughs> okay. ma and I'm trying to sure. help other people see those peeps, sure. because it gives us a more dimensional perspective into the nuance of what civilization went through to get to the point of where right. we're at today, right. instead of just right. living in the consumer here and ad now. here and now yeah advertising dopamine re rewards all the time right um it's really good to just you know i i actually did bear i did actually barely tear up because it is so fucking <laughs> beautiful it is just beautiful to get those peeps i like how you call it a peep that's and that's a, all it is that's really? all it is exactly it's just a peep yeah into um, it. um 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 that's why we do this it, show. I get a little peep. <laughs> I get a peep from you. You get a peep from me. They get a peep from the conversation. Right. Um, maybe. And <laughs> maybe. And I think it's. I think it's really important to get. Um, you know, we just had. Yesterday we were talking about biohacking and the importance of of of, of ketones um, and um, ex exogenous ketones into your body and fasting and things like this yeah. and. Um, what, you know, even though that's such a future thing is these ketone drinks, at the same time it's a little peep into your inner mechanisms. When you fast, your glucose drops, and if you really feel that feeling, then your liver starts burning fat, and that's when you go into ketosis. And so oh. again, so you get this peep, you get little peeps like that into- um, This into other realm. Different realms, yeah. 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 Um, Philology gives that to me. Um, uh, I, I, a lot of my friends back in Australia and uh, indeed around the world now. It definitely think, does. Yes, um, philology does. Think that I lead, uh, that I'm always partying, having you know vino, grappa, mm. and uh, pasta, and what have mm. you. Uh, sure, sure, <laughs> I am. <laughs> that happens too. Yeah. Okay, and it's all wonderful. It's yes, great. Yes. But I actually lead a rather quiet existence in Italy. Uh, especially in my home outside Spoleto. Um, I spend uh, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a day, and that means weeks, that means years, on my own uh, in my uh, studio, uh, which is a small building outside. I have a uh, 14th century watchtower. Oh my gosh. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, on four levels, it, it's, it's wonderful. It's called Icerri. Uh, in a place called Poreta. Ron and I are coming. Uh, we'll, okay. be, we'll be there later this year. <laughs> Benissimo. <laughs> Bring simulation to Italy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, uh, there is no greater satisfaction in my life. And I'm talking about food, I'm talking about sex, I'm talking yeah. about um, conversation comes close. Yes. Right? Yes. The peeps. Yeah. <laughs> but when. Um, you're sitting in your, at your desk and uh, you suddenly realize what the narrative technique is, what you realize what is really being communicated through that text, which ah. is probably in Latin yeah. uh, or in early Italian. Uh, and you realize that because you know the critical literature that you're the first person to have understood. Oh, and, that's cool. And the no, first to uh, understand. Yeah. There is, there is, if I may say so, there is no greater satisfaction. Correct. Than that. the, um, and that's I, a real hit. And I can piggyback on that just a little bit because mm. I gain these. I'm not the first, um, right. like you are, to yeah. get that <clears throat> essence of literature from right. someone. But <clears throat> what I can say about <clears throat> the, the same greatest 
feelings in life are yeah. when I sit across from you and uh, you are the uh, one or the like I was explaining the the team from yesterday those sure, guys yesterday sure. that are doing what they're doing sure. that they sit here and they teach me sure. and as I'm now you're in a privileged position here yeah. I structure what you're saying and you go you know Saint Francis the the song of the creatures and when you say that and I go aha I have the eureka moment for myself, right. and then I go, right. wow, that's so yeah. cool. Minds expand yeah. in new dimensions. That's what happened yeah. at 12. Okay, yeah. so um, the, we're, we were talking about the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. The, um, the oh, right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Great. great. Okay, and that was a part of Dante we were talking well, about. Well, that's, 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 that's the ancient world. Uh, that's how, mm, until you get a certain development in warfare, uh, particularly development of cannon, cannon, yes. Cannons. Uh, battering so, rams are also known. Well, battering rams have always been around. Yeah. Um, uh, around the early 16th century, there's a huge development in, in warfare whereby um, the army could actually place itself at a greater distance from a city. Wow. And yeah. uh, um, if you have uh, um, tall walls that are relatively thin, yeah. they can be easily knocked down. Yes. And so walls, city walls have to become uh, lower, but also much thicker. Thicker. And there was a wonderful city called Lucca uh, in Italy, which has these these walls that are cannon, effectively cannon proof. Whoa! Right? How are they cannon proof? They're just because shorter they're, they're, and they're, thicker. They're, 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 uh, I don't know. I've never measured them. They'd be ten meters thick. But then the problem is the cannons will then shoot over the walls if they're too short. As yes, well. yes. But it's also, I mean, very costly to to create, to build. I mean, these are. Uh, the efforts that take generations. Correct, exactly. And uh, exactly. Uh, I can't imagine at what expense uh, for, for um, the citizens of that town to actually yeah. um, have to put up with. And then they live there for hundreds, if not a thousand years in that place that they actually built over generations with their, mm. with their um, blood, sweat and tears. When, when Dante is exiled, or when anyone is exiled... Uh, oh, they have to leave uh, the fort. Well, they have to leave. The thing is, um, they lose all civil rights. Um, any citizen, uh, if there is a death sentence, any citizen of that town can actually um, kill a, an exile. Wow. Um, that uh, is messed up. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, There's no rehabilitation. There can be. There can be. Um, um, Dante's uh, properties were by and large um, confiscated, but uh, his wife and his children were still allowed to remain. They were allowed to remain in, inside Florence. Um, it's good the family doesn't get exiled, just the it, it, it can happen, though. Yeah, it yeah. can happen. Um, there were at least two uh, occasions in which Dante was uh, afforded a pardon. And uh, the thing is with Dante, Dante is, um, at the end of the day, exile is a positive um, factor because had Dante not been exiled, uh, he might have remained a municipal poet, um, a good letter writer. Correct, yeah. And uh, we would not have had, for sure, we would not have had uh, um, this first treatise on linguistics, um, which, is on, which is called The Eloquence of uh, uh, the Vernacular. Um, yeah. And we would definitely not have had the comedy. Yeah, and let's, uh, un let's unpack that. So he goes into exile. Yeah. Where is exile? And then what- Good uh, question. Yeah. What is exile? Where is exile? Exile is everything outside your city walls. Okay, and so he- And uh, here talking about Florence. Okay. About 1302. Okay. Uh, okay. And Florence is at war with Arezzo, which by mm. car today is an hour's drive. Um, it's at okay. war with Siena. Wow. Uh, it doesn't get on with Pistoia, because the different political colors. There are some cities okay. that actually um, support the papal cause, other cities that, call, that support the imperial cause. Uh, what, what are those? Can you explain those quickly? Um, church uh, and empire. Oh, okay. So we have at a macro, uh, the macro level, uh, we have these two, we have these, um, these, contrasting, these contrasting forces at loggerheads. Church, uh, the Pope, or in Dante's time, a few years into his exile, the, Pope, the papacy actually moves from Rome to Avignon in uh, what is now southern France, in Provence. 
uh, and it stays there effectively for most of the 14th century. And it's called uh, the, um, in Italian, the Cattività Avignonese. Uh, and so this captivity, uh, even Avignon, on the one hand. So we have the popes, who are also kings. They, have, uh, they are kings, they own states their own cities, they have their armies, they actually invade wow. and kill wow. in order to take over other cities, yeah. um, on the one hand. On the other, we have uh, the emperor. Now, the emperor, uh, in, uh, uh, there are certain periods in which um, there is no emperor, and so the empire was, out, was without a leader. Um, and he, um, at least in name, uh, has power uh, over life and death of every citizen in Christendom, from Jerusalem up to Scotland, and everything in between. It's crazy. Uh, now, uh, another little peep into uh, what would that person's life, the king or the person that owns, uh, what did they do to their life journey to get to that point? And then uh, what, does, what goes through their mind when they're in control of all these people and resources going and trying to get more? And um, Lots of things. <laughs> um, we must talk about certain uh, families that, that vie to... Um, with, with the empire, there, is, there are um, competing elements. Uh, one of which is German law against Roman law. Now, and they are uh, very often compatible, but not always. Uh, in uh, um, Roman law, we have uh, um, inheritance. Mm. Um, and inheritance also uh, of a title. Well, in German law, however, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Mm. Uh, that is, your son doesn't necessarily become the leader of the clan, of the village, okay. of the kingdom, yeah. or in this case, of the empire. And there's, so in German law, there would be potentially a vote then? Yes, exactly. And there are certain people okay. who are allowed to vote and others who aren't. aren't. And within, okay. uh, in, the, in the later Middle Ages, um, so after the year 1000, let's say in the 1200s, 1300s in Dante's time, uh, there are there only about seven or eight grand electors, they're called. Uh, and these people can be archbishops, uh, they're normally princes, um, and they uh, get together and they elect a, the king of the Germans. Uh, he was always called first, uh, and then he was possibly also crowned uh, emperor. Okay, so there's all these different historical um, differences in the yeah. way that we, we live and we, um, people in power and what the rules of law are. So, so Dante's exiled, um, as he's exiled, he is uh, potentially some of the reason why he writes the Divine Comedy and what, why he um, describes this heaven, hell, purgatory is because of his exile. If he wasn't, then we potentially, and this, uh, the same thing applies to a lot of our world today, is when, we, when we're put into situations mm that p p put stress on us in different ways. It's funny how fast we move forward. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and so definitely. that's what we were talking about at, you know, Tony Robbins' last Necessity, week. the mother of invention, that's it. Necessity, the mother of invention. Yeah, yes. that's great. So yeah. you have yeah, a little yeah, yeah. fire under your ass Absolutely. that gets you there. And you get cracking, you get moving. Cranking. And so, right. okay, so teach about um, the Divine Comedy and Heaven, Hell, Purgatory. Let's talk about that. Okay, great. Um, Dante's in exile, and uh, therefore uh, being in exile, being an exile, um, means that you are automatically in a different realm. And you have a different mindset. Uh, you are on the run. Uh, you do not have any uh, steady income. Uh, someone such as Dante uh, could not really become uh, a blacksmith. Yeah. Right? He didn't have a trade. Mm -hmm. uh, he could write letters, right. and so he would write letters for people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, tr he knocked on many a court door, uh, saying, let me in, let me in. Uh, some people did, uh, many didn't, yeah. uh, for various reasons. Yeah. Um, uh, First of all, exile means for Dante remaining around Florence because he hopes to be allowed back in. And, and a year goes by, five years go by, ten years go by, and he realizes that's not going to happen. 
Uh, a second amnesty was actually uh, proclaimed uh, at one stage. Uh, mm. However, he would have had to do penance, that is, cover himself in uh, sackcloth uh, and uh, um, charcoal, um, ashes in his hair, uh, run around uh, the baptistry of Florence, I don't know how many times, three times, I think, uh, and ask for forgiveness because he happened to have belonged to the wrong faction. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, or is purported to have said, uh, this is no way to invite Dante Alighieri back to Florence. Yeah. I prefer to remain in exile, which he does. Yeah. Now, um, um, entire generations of scholars um, in Italy and outside Italy um, have asked the same question. That is, uh, why write the comedy as he did, that is, with uh, um, hell, purgatory, and heaven. Um, that is, what's the point? Yes. Why create this, uh, the idea of the journey through the three realms of the afterlife uh, as a living person uh, in order to, uh, to say what? What's the ultimate aim? Well, uh, there are many answers to that and no particular answer to that. Um, Or better, there are certain answers that are um, uh, valid for the various realms. Let's go with the most well-known answer. Is there one? Is there one? <laughs> yeah. A good one, I yeah. like, uh, because I've been dealing a lot with the paradiso, with the, with the heaven uh, mm -hmm. in the last mm -hmm. few years. Paradiso. Paradiso. Um, and in paradiso, um, in heaven, um, Dante actually puts uh, people together. These are people who have made it, right? These are people who uh, did not, uh, were not sent to hell. Oh, you were sent to hell um, if you were born before the, uh, the advent of Christ, hmm. right? And so poor Virgil, hmm. okay, the greatest hmm. Latin poet ever, uh, who was actually Dante's, the character Dante, uh, his uh, guide, uh, right through hell, right through purgatory, um, is uh, doomed to spend eternity in limbo, right? Um, or uh, you get into hell, you are sent to hell if you have not been baptized. And so, um, it's, it's obviously, it's in a Christian paradigm, uh, and, uh, and so the, uh, the Christian element, you must be uh, a, a baptized Christian in order to move up, as it were. If you are in hell, you will always be in hell, end of story. If you get sent to purgatory, it means that prima o poi, eventually, uh, you'll make it. Now, a way to hurry things up, of course, is to have, is to leave a lot of money uh, with the people you've left behind so that they actually have uh, masses um, uh, celebrated for you every morning and that actually move you up more quickly Interesting. right um, sometimes uh, even though you may have uh, spent an entire life um, fighting against the church fighting against Christ uh, um, but um, on your deathbed or in the case of certain um, princely uh, uh, what can I say uh, warriors um, one, uh, one tier of contrition will be enough to actually make you, will allow you to get into purgatory. In heaven, um, if you make it into paradiso, you've made it. And what does it, what does it mean to have made it? It means that you actually can spend the rest of eternity contemplating the face of God, whatever that might mean. Um, Dante himself does just that in the last uh, two ca cantos of uh, the Paradiso. But what does Dante do? Um, there is an entire uh, branch of critical literature uh, regarding his um, anti-Islamic uh, stance. Mm -hmm. He's Christian in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, it's like being anti-Semitic in the mm -hmm. Middle Ages. Um, many people, it's just part of uh, institutionalized faith as it was managed. Correct, yeah. Right? My deity is right. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, who is the infidel? Well, the other guy, yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and yet, and yet, 
what does uh, Dante do? In, in heaven, in the canto number 10, and we're a third of the way practically through his journey through, um, through heaven, he puts these two enemies together. Now, um, one is a lead, the leader of uh, uh, the Thomist, uh, Dominican uh, order. The other one is a man uh, who uh, espoused, uh, who had taught uh, at Paris, the University of Paris, um, some ideas that were felt to be, by the Dominicans, they were felt to be uh, heretical. Uh, and he taught a, uh, an Islamic um, um, philosopher uh, called Averroes, um, who had actually um, taught in um, Moorish Spain a couple of centuries beforehand that uh, in, you could actually um, arrive at contemplating God through the development uh, of uh, your soul intellect. So intellect itself can be enough to contemplate God that is without faith. Huh. Now, obviously heretical, obviously not Catholic, not Christian, or not in the canonized, not in the scholastic version of that uh, at Paris. Uh, and uh, um, the leaders, the Dominican leaders at Paris at the time, actually have uh, uh, this man killed. This man is called Sigeri di Brabante. Uh, and uh, he is assassinated in, in, uh, in Italy, at the papal court, by the way. Um, what does Dante do? He puts them together. They are sitting together for eternity. Hmm. Now, what, and they, whereas in life, uh, as you know, alive, they had been mortal enemies, uh, each the nemesis of the other. So what is the ultimate aim of uh, the Paradiso? What is the ultimate aim of the comedy? To teach that reconciliation is indeed possible. That reconciliation, even between someone who had uh, um, borne the, 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 the banner of uh, standard Christian faith on the one hand, the other one, uh, the banner of uh, Islamic thought, yeah. Uh, though himself a Christian, um, could actually sit together harmoniously, yeah. singing songs of praise awesome. Okay, awesome. for eternity. So, so, so how was that communicated through the Divine Comedy, through the Paradiso? How, how was that communicated? There is, okay, there are certain um, formations that Dante sees, uh, and uh, generally they are angels. Uh, in Spoleto, I'll be giving this Friday uh, a talk on uh, uh, the ladder, Jacob's ladder, uh, in, mm. uh, in uh, the Paradiso, uh, Parad uh, so Heaven 21. Is, is, is the Divine Comedy chunked up by Paradiso, Purgatory, and Hell? Oh, yeah, there are, there are these three sections. There are three sections. Yeah, three okay. sections. There are three, uh, three um, canticles, they're called. Mm -hmm. um, this word's coming up yeah, very often. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, it's because, you know, uh, Composing poetry and singing go hand in glove. Yeah, yeah. Right? And like you said, uh, necessity uh, is the, the mother of invention. Mother <laughs> of invention. So uh, again, it's like these shorter, more concise phrases right. are, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, um, that's a canticle. It's a singing. It's a singing to describe existence or life in shorter in, ways. Indeed, and indeed. Poetry the does that too. Paradiso yeah. does that too. Okay, so one more time. So Paradiso um, focuses on uh, two people, even though from different backgrounds or different mindsets, can still re reconcile and sit harmoniously. Absolutely. And then what's Absolutely. the essence of purgatory and the essence of hell as well? Um, for a start, um, the afterlife, uh, albeit in these three different realms, is full of noise. Mm. Uh, the noise that we hear in Inferno, in uh, Hell, uh, is of course cacophonic. Uh, you hear people uh, screaming, um, you hear devils uh, cackling, uh, um, uh, there are people crying, this is great. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Perfect timing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, there, is a, there is this cacophonic din all the time in Inferno. Uh, so it's full of noise. And uh, the ultimate aim, basically, there are other, there were actually precedents. There are actually other forms, um, artworks, uh, frescoes, um, depicting fire. 
uh, depicting mm -hmm. um, punishment after death. Um, uh, and we spoke before about this, uh, this dichotomy that is uh, black and white, night and day, man, woman. Uh, well, uh, there used to be only heaven and hell. Uh, there is one line by St. Paul uh, who says that uh, uh, your sins will be purged through fire. Uh, and from that one line, uh, the whole uh, dogma of purgatory was developed in the Middle Ages as this separate realm where people would actually purge uh, their sins, purify themselves, uh, that is, work their sins away, as it were, uh, in order to finally get into heaven. Uh, and uh, purgatory is depicted, uh, imagine this, this setting. So purging um, their sins away. Yes. So it's the state between the heaven and the hell. You, you're trying to purge your sins away to get into paradise. Yes, and so that will take hundreds, if not thousands, of years. All right? And the purgatory uh, is imagined uh, by Dante to be a mountain, and, uh, um, which is probably in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. It's outside the Mediterranean basin. Oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spot for this. Why is uh -huh. there a spot for this? Because uh, according to um, uh, the medieval mindset uh, and how medieval man thought the world to be, when Lucifer, the most beautiful angel, was actually um, thrown down, forced out of heaven, and hurled down to, have, to uh, the earth plane, um, he fell, okay, and uh, uh, with such force uh, that he ended up at the very center of the earth, uh, and therefore he displaced that amount of earth uh, through to the other side, Whoa. creating this mountain. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay. Which happened to be in the middle of the Atlantic somewhere. And it gave people the chance then to get to paradise, the mountain did. Yes. Okay. okay. And okay. so paradoxically. Okay. Paradoxically. But, you know, Lucifer is actually uh, sitting at the very center, at the very bottom oh, of so, the pit so of funny. hell, uh, waiting waiting for the likes of me and you, perhaps if we're uh, unfortunate enough to be uh, relegated to, to hell. Um, so, uh, purgatory is a mountain, and you arrive there um, by boat. And uh, uh, there is a whole tradition, that it's probably Etruscan, so pre-Roman, um, uh, from Italy, uh, um, you are put onto this boat, uh, go, you are taken down the Tiber, uh, because the Tiber, as uh, you may know, um, today it starts in Romagna, this other region. Why? Because uh, the dictator Mussolini was uh, Romagnolo, uh, and he changed the, uh, the borders of the regions of Italy, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. the Tiber would actually start in the region in which he had been born. Okay. okay. But in Dante's time, so before the 20th century, the Tiber was also like the Arno. Uh, the Tiber uh, was also um, in Tuscany. I want us to get to everything, so let's go more rapid. Okay, okay sure. Okay. Because sure. Uh, we also have the four o'clock as well, and we want to get you in the portrait book. So Whoa. let's let's go <laughs> let's go let's go a little bit more. Sure. Along okay. our way. Sure. So, okay, so we just did purgatory. Well, so, we're trying to finish purgatory. So, the, the idea of purgatory is to uh, purge your sins. Yep. Okay? So that you can actually get into heaven one yep. day. Yep. And then that's uh, through a lot of introspective process. You got to look inward. Well, through punishment. Through punishment. Through punishment. Yeah, there are various punishments. Um, there are punishments in hell uh, that are eternal. No way out. That's it. So are we on hell now? Where um, we oh, can be. Okay, let's uh, go. Okay. Um, the punishments in purgatory, just to finish on mm -hmm. that, uh, will eventually end. You will eventually, um, when you mm -hmm. first uh, get admitted into purgatory, you have seven Ps uh, branded on your forehead. Uh, um, and you every to P. Them. Yes, so to with every, and the P okay, is peccato. Peccato. Meaning sin. So sin. they have the seven deadly sins oh, yeah. branded onto your forehead okay. and they get removed one by one. I think Ron has like 15 deadly sins on his <laughs> forehead. Um, yes, yeah, so what? <laughs> yes, yeah, so what? Hell. Yeah. Um, hell is a wonderful place. Um, hell is the, the, the first canticle, is the canticle that most, everyone who knows Dante loves hell. 
uh, because it's much more dramatic. The language is gutsy. Okay. Uh, you, it is really it's hell, fire, and brimstone. It's yeah. it's uh, it's it's hellish, literally hellish. And yet, uh, there is there are several moments uh, in hell. Uh, the first one, of course, is the most famous. Um, Canto number five. Canto number five uh, retells a story um, of star-crossed lovers. Um, a um, brother-in-law has fallen in love with his sister-in-law and uh, there is a bacio. There is a kiss. And uh, whether this kiss should be understood as euphemism for something much more uh, is probably the case. Um, but this is effectively the very first time in, uh, well, since Roman times, since classical literature, that uh, we have uh, a kiss, that we have uh, the idea of sexuality actually emerging in literature. Not even, the, not even in the Provencal paradigm did we have uh, um, a man and a woman kissing. Okay. That is the embrace, the sexual embrace. And this so, has to do with hell because... We are in hell um, because it is a question of uh, um, incest. Mm. Uh, it is a question of uh, infidelity. Yeah, okay. Um, we have uh, um, so betrayal. Okay. Uh, and therefore, by canon law, uh, these two lovers are to be relegated to hell for eternity. And this is a story in the Divine Comedy Absolutely. That, that, that Dante's writing. Absolutely. Okay. Now, her name is Francesca. His name is Paolo. Paolo and Francesca. Mm -hmm. Paul and Francoise. Mm -hmm. uh, Paolo Francesca. Um, well, actually, um, it's really odd because, uh, as you said, there's a whole series of firsts from Francis on. Um, the first here is that it's not Paolo speaking. It's not the man speaking on behalf of the woman. What does Paolo do right throughout the canto? He is sobbing. He's crying. He can't cope. There is this infernal wind that has been blowing around, the wind of lust, the wind of passion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, Dante actually asks Virgil if he might be able to go over and speak to them, and they come over to him like doves. Uh, and it is as if the wind stops for a second, and uh, she speaks. Uh, and uh, uh, she speaks about uh, this love, uh, that was born, that was created, uh, uh, that came into existence between uh, her and Paolo. Where? Why? How? Because they had been reading about uh, uh, the Knights of the Round Table mm -hmm. and uh, uh, where Lancelot and Guinevere had actually discovered uh, that they too had fallen in love with each other. Mm. And so we have the idea of uh, um, love begetting love, mm -hmm. this mise en abîme, this, 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 uh, this uh, abyss with love actually drawing us uh, to love. Yeah, yeah. Because we have uh, in Dante's time the whole idea of uh, social movement. Um, that is, how does one move up socially if one is not noble? Well, you do that by perfecting uh, your intellect, by becoming a poet, mm. right? By becoming mm -hmm. intellectual, and therefore by developing a, a more refined, a more courtly idea of love. So the whole uh, court, courtly love paradigm, the amour courtois um, paradigm is fundamental here. It means that you are already an elect spirit if you know how to love courteously. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, be, be gentle with your love. Be within this dance, as we call it, right? of love. Right. And, and right. Be, be kind. That's a, that's a derivative of, of the whole paradigm here. Okay, right. so is there something else that we should mention from the Dante and from exile literature and divine comedy and other one of those wow things? There are a million and one There's things. so many. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to do, yeah, we'll have to do more of the wows. Right. Um, okay. Um, when we when we bring simulation to Italy for some um, vino and some pasta, some uh, wonderful. good conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. So maybe let's um, as quick as possible. Let's touch on two Renaissance friends. What's a good wow from, from okay. that? Okay. Yeah. Um, the book Two Renaissance to Renaissance Friends uh, uh, is a collection of poetry. 
Uh, in the case of Castiglioni, the first of the two authors, uh, this poetry was already known, even though most of it, even though there are some new um, pieces that I've discovered. Domizio Falcone is completely new. Uh, he, ha he is someone who's been overlooked by uh, scholarly um, endeavor, scholarly work. Um, what's fascinating about Domizio Falcone? Many things. Um, uh, he worked at the court, he lived at the court of uh, Mantua, and so we're under the Gonzaga uh, rule. Uh, Mantua is in north, central northern um, Italy, northern Italy. It's in lower Lombardy, if that means anything to you, just south of Milan. I want to get to as much of the essence right now as we can, right. and then we'll get to um, the more details as, as in our later discussions, just because we're cutting it close on some time, and I want to Great. get to okay. like, some of this essence. What is like the... Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, here we have uh, the uh, emergence of um, a treatise on love, again. Mm. But love and not spiritual love, but love in the here and the now. Mm. And uh, he becomes, he is uh, acclaimed as... Uh, by the Gonzagas, by Castiglione, as being uh, an expert on love. Um, that is, love at its, at its most base. Uh, and so, uh, in his exaltation of Priapus, uh, the ever erect god of uh, the lesser, uh, the lesser god of the kitchen garden in Roman times, mm -hmm. uh, with his ever erect penis, um, ever on the one hand, penis. that's true, uh -huh. uh, on the one hand, uh -huh. uh, on the other, sounds like my dick, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, oh, come on, okay, continue, hey, he wrote about it 600, yeah, well, it's 400 years there, ago, it's all there, it's all there, it's, it's still here um, today, and so moving pants. right up to um, various types of relationships, um, heterosexual, homosexual, um, uh, but never talking about spiritual relationships on the one hand. On the other, it's also about uh, history of art. If you know um, uh, the uh, painter Mantegna, yeah. uh, there is a first uh, uh, in this book, one of the firsts. Uh, it is in as much as um, Domizio Falcone actually writes uh, a piece, an epigram, uh, on a painting that we no longer have. The painting um, that, that Mantegna had uh, uh, painted uh, on the race between Hippomenes and Atalanta. You might remember the one by Guidoreni uh, in which um, there is a race. Uh, it is, uh, it's about alchemy, really, and so the transformative nature of love, yet again, uh, in art. Uh, love is so transformative. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, Hippomenes, oh, Atalanta is a goddess, Hippomenes is not, he's mortal. Um, but they're both, uh, she actually races against her lovers. Uh, and uh, when, if they lose, and they invariably do, because she is a goddess, uh, she kills them. Um, Hippomenes, however, comes up with the golden apples, and he, and he, and he throws these golden apples, at, and she stoops to pick them up. So she actually has to slow down. Mm. Okay? And then they fall in love with each other. Uh, and uh, we would not have known that Mantegna had actually painted this uh, had it not been for uh, Domizio Falcone. Okay, so, all right, this is, again, we're just so amazingly exploding mind into history and understanding mm. how, um, you know, philology actually works with language right. from this uh, really top-down perspective of how it's being communicated to other people. Mm. We get these little peeps into history mm. um, that we've been discussing. It's been so good. Um, all right, let's do a couple simulation questions for you. The first question let's ask you is, how do you think we can maximize human potential? By conversing more, uh, reading more, and by studying philology. Yeah. Philology really is that dance between your understanding of the word and the word itself. Yeah. And so really, it's, about, it's, re it's really um, self-analysis yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's Albeit through the paradigm of history, of other texts written by other people, um, yep. uh, with uh, um, this interdisciplinary approach that is history of art with everything, images, TV, yep, yep. Uh, and so it's your relationship between yourself uh, and uh, the outside world. Yeah, yeah, and the understanding yeah. that is a main pillar in Trying maximizing your being aware that, that you should. Being is, aware that you should, yeah. Is yeah. the beginning. And I then think. 
trying to become an expert at it. That's one of the main ways to become a master of oneself is through this process. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, good. How about what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world. Uh, uh, God. Um, looking at the stars. Um, looking uh, over the valley from my terrace with a glass of white wine around six o'clock, half past six. Uh, <laughs> sounds amazing. Um, yeah. Knowing that I'm going to go to dinner or have dinner at my place with, lo with lovely friends. With friends. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Great answer. How about, what do you think is the purpose of life? Again, these are the, the big questions, the purpose of life. I don't know the purpose of life uh, in my case um, is to not leave any damage, uh, to better myself as a person, uh, to not further knowledge. That's not the point mm. here in my work, because uh, my work is my passion, is my life, um, to um, I don't want to say to spread joy. Uh, it sounds too facile and too, mm -hmm. too infantile. It's good. Um, but um, that's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. um, um, to be an example, first of all, for myself uh, and for those immediately around me uh, of how you can actually get joy uh, from, from, from life. Uh, I certainly do do that. Um, yes, you do. I do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Look at I know, that smile. I, I, and I, that laugh. Yeah. I, I know I'm never going to become a millionaire, but who cares, really? Yeah. Uh, impact is really the most important thing, not the money. It's the impact that's the most important thing. Right. Yep. Um, I know that I have a greater um, sense of worth um, because of what I do. Yeah. It's important. Yep. Um, and people tend to like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and a lot of this stuff is really, really, uh, it's, re it's really moving. It's we really got moving. Moved a, we got moved several yeah. times in this yeah. uh, conversation. Yeah. I got moved yeah. several times in this conversation. Um, and I feel like by through my movement, you got moved. <laughs> and I got moved all, and hopefully people at home did too. Yeah. Okay. How about what is one of your greatest fears? What is your greatest fear? Greatest fear? Well, I'm not, I'm not uh, afraid of dying. Um, I'm not even really of pain. Fear. Um, ah. Do I have fears? Um, That people are going to realize that um, I'm only full of passion. I don't really, I'm not really an expert on what I'm talking about. Um, but that, that is, that disappears straight away as well. I realize there are there's certain ex series of anxieties, sources of anxiety uh, about that. Um, not knowing, for example, when I went to Berkeley last week, uh, not knowing what I would find. Yeah. Uh, and, but you know, uh, and I realize that I'm, I'm fairly lucky. If these are my fears, yeah, that I'm they're lucky. lucky. <laughs> How right. about, are we alone in the cosmos? Whoa, uh, probably not. You know, I used to, I used to uh, ask myself these, these same questions years ago. I, as a little kid, I used to stand outside in the backyard in Australia, um, saying, Martians, Martians, come down and fetch me. Fetch me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want out of this. Um, but I, I realized uh, in my late teens, I think, um, that um, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether reincarnation exists. It doesn't matter even whether God exists or paradiso mm. exists. What really does matter is the quality of life we must all strive individually and collectively to, um, to have here now. Good. And then do you think we're in a computer simulation? Um, <laughs> I hope not. Um, but no, I don't think we're, no. no, no, no. no. Uh, it'd be sad. It'd be really, really sad if we were. But Why would it be sad? Sad. Uh, uh, think of uh, uh, the, um, 
the people manipulating uh, this reality. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, how vacuous their lives must be. Um, and if anything, if that were the case, um, we're probably living, leading the better existence anyway. And I think, you know, to hell with them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ronnie, what a pleasure. Thank you. This has been um, an amazing conversation. It's always pleasurable for me to talk about my work. I love teaching uh, and sharing. Yes. Um, and this is unusual for me as a situation, uh, but um, I thank you. I thank you sincerely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Ro Ronnie Lokash, thank you for joining us. Um, we covered so many great topics. I will be your student for a very long time. Um, <laughs> and we'll come visit. Good. Come visit. Good. We definitely come visit in Spoleto, at, uh, in, Ro uh, in Rome, Spoleto. at... Uh, Core in Enna. Yes, do yeah. the um, Copa de Vino with the sunset. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. We covered so many great topics. I, I love the peeps. We're definitely going to have to keep the peeps as something that we're going to... Peeps are good. Peeps are great. Mm. Um, that was good. And then um, it was uh, Necessity's the Mother of Innovation was another one. Of oh, invention. Of anyway. invention. I think I might have translated that from the Italian or from the Latin. I forget. I don't know. I don't remember anymore, you know? That's... Well, these languages uh, come yeah. and go. Philology, right? make sure to look that up. Get deeper into understanding that. Mm. And if you guys had a good time, like, comment, subscribe. Check us out on Patreon. Give us a little bit of support. That would be very helpful. If you found the content useful, definitely share it with others. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Ron Vargas, our producer and director. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.